So this is going to be a fun video. I will give you guys my hot take alert right off the bat. If you don't want to hear almost non-stop praise towards Transformers Revenge of the Fallen, click off this video because you're going to get heated and I don't, I don't want you to be in a bad mood over this video. That would make me feel bad. So just, you know, don't watch it then. Hey guys, welcome back. So last month, I posted a video on why Michael Bay's original Transformers film is still great. And thank you all so much for watching that, leaving a like, leaving a comment, hitting subscribe from that video. It means a lot to me seeing how much traffic there is around it, seeing how much love and praise it's been getting is awesome. Seeing how it kind of popped off is great because I put a lot of energy, effort, love, and care into that video. So it's nice to see that you guys are all loving it. Uh, but we're not here to talk about the 2007 one. We're here to continue talking about the trilogy because, as I have stated, this original trilogy means a lot to me. There's a lot of nostalgia in these movies, and while I think that Age of Extinction and The Last Night did a lot of harm to the franchise, these first three movies that Michael Bay did, while they're not the greatest movies of all time, and while this is not anywhere close to being one of the greatest trilogies or stories of all time, it's such a fun pretty well executed trilogy that I've been wanting to talk about. And so in this video, we get to talk about Transformers Revenge of the Fallen, or the bad one as people call it. And I'm going to talk about how this film may be slightly underrated. So once again, I'm going to hit you guys with a hot take alert. It's going to get a bit spicy up in here in this video today, so that'll be fun. So if you have not watched the original video, go watch the original video, come back, watch this one. With all that out of the way, let's hop into Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. Before we get into actually talking about the, the movie and breaking it down, let's talk about the production issues that affected this film. And I guess it's pretty good timing for me releasing this video because right now we are in the midst of another one of these in Hollywood and that is the writer's strike. So the Writers Guild of America was going into strike uh, while this movie was entering the writing phase, meaning that Aaron Kruger, Alex Kurtzman, and Roberto Orchi, the, the writers of this film, did not have the time to actually make a screenplay for the movie before it went into production because the time scale was not being pushed back to accommodate for the strike because that's just not how Hollywood works. And so what they ended up doing is they had to write up a very basic outline of the film, get as many pages as they could done of the script, and I believe they submitted a 14-page outline, and that's essentially what Michael Bay had to work with. So a lot of it on the day was Michael Bay and Shia LaBeouf just thinking of stuff and essentially writing the film as they went along, which is why this film seems like a mess sometimes, why it's got weird timeline things, weird plot holes, weird plot devices, because they never had the time to iron all that out, and they never had the time to even get a script finished for this movie. Now, this affected a lot of films during that time. I'd say this is probably the most notable one, uh, but another one is X-Men Origins Wolverine. Coming for blood. No code of conduct. No law. We know how that movie turned out. So now that the first of many elephants in the room are addressed, let's actually talk about the movie. So Revenge of the Fallen starts out somewhat like its predecessor. It's something that all three of these original films do, or I guess all of them actually do it, because four and five do it also, so it's something that was kept consistent. But the first film started with the Allspark, the main MacGuffin of the movie, flying to Earth, and Optimus does a voiceover over it to kind of catch us up on what exactly is happening in this world of Transformers and how we got to this point. This movie does something similar, and I really respect what they do. So in 17,000 BC, way back when, uh, before the Allspark landed on Earth, before Megatron landed on Earth, a group of Transformers landed in what we now know to be Egypt, or Giza more specifically, and they bring with them this giant pyramid-looking thing called the Sun Harvester. Uh, we learn more of this information later in the film, but this basically sets up that the Autobots coming to Earth in 2007 
was not the first time that Earth came in contact with the Transformers. Decepticons have come to this planet before, and it's pretty heavily implied that the thing they were here for thousands of years ago is what they're here for in this movie. And of course, Optimus narrates over all of this because you have to have an Optimus Prime narration. Uh, something more, in fact, don't do that one, two, and three, do, do. <laughs> and again, we don't yet know what this machine is or why the Transformers are here. That's revealed to us throughout the movie. But I love, and I'm not saying this sarcastically in any way, I love that they leaned into the conspiracy theory that the pyramids were built by aliens. Because even though they weren't built by aliens, the pyramid was built around the Sun Harvester. And then the other pyramids were just built because of that one. I think that's really cool. I like when they lean into stuff like that and be like, yeah, all this like weird looking stuff that isn't that weird, but humans seem to think it's weird. Transformers, they go a bit too hard with it later in this franchise, but luckily we're not gonna talk about those movies. And then we get the hook of the movie. Just like the first film did, we're introduced to the world initially before the title card, and then the hook of the movie is something really badass. The first scene is getting us introduced to the world and just to the concepts and vague hints to the plot. Then we get the hook of the movie that's actually designed to pull us in and excite us for it. And in the first film, it was humans getting their asses beat by blackout. So in this movie, the difference is it's still humans fighting a Decepticon, but this time they have Autobot help. I love it when a sequel starts with the good guys just doing cool shit. And so does Michael Bay, apparently, because this opening fight scene is so exciting. Just the way it's built up from the, the moment the scene starts all the way up through the very end of the scene. It's so thrilling. It's such a well-crafted action sequence, except for like one detail that we'll talk about in a minute. So we're in Shanghai at 10.14 p.m., but the sun is still up when the scene starts, so we got some weird timeline shenanigans going on. And of course, we got some Optimus Prime narration to catch us up, because there's been two years between these movies. These movies take place in the year they were released. So between 2007 and 2009, that's two years of stuff, Optimus has to catch us up. So he tells us the Autobots, they're chilling on Earth now. They have an alliance with the humans, a strike team called Nest, kind of a black ops branch of the Air Force that Lennox runs. And there's also a new team of Autobots that responded to Optimus's call at the end of the first film and came to Earth. So now they have a bigger Autobot team. And now they are basically just going on black ops missions around the world to take out whatever remaining Decepticons are still here. So that is a very good setup. But I always wondered, because the Autobots are not revealed to the world until after Optimus Prime dies, how do they manage to cover up all the destruction they leave? Like, you're telling me that a giant construction vehicle robot ripping through Shanghai and then a truck transforming and jumping off the bridge to grab said construction vehicle while a pickup truck shoots at its feet and then it gets shot point blank range. You're telling me that that doesn't exist anywhere? Like somehow all of that just got wiped and it's like the Transformers never existed. So here's the new Autobots that we have on Earth. We have Jolt, who's in this movie for like three scenes. He does one key thing, but he's only here. This is actually a really funny story. The reason Jolt is in this movie, he's he's the blue Autobot. They did not get the, the like deal finished to use that particular car until they were already filming. So they just had to put Jolt in the background of stuff. And so that's why he just randomly pops up. But yes, yeah, so Jolt is on the team. Uh, RC, or they called me RC Twins, but there's three of them. I guess it's like RC, Alita One, I don't know what the other one is. Um, and then Sideswipe. Those are the main ones. Well, all of them, because the twins are in this movie. I really wish they weren't. 
Now, I'm sorry to keep you guys in suspense, but I'm actually gonna talk about the twins later because they're not really introduced here. So I'll talk about them later, closer to when they actually become major characters in the story. And what's cool is they don't hint at it in this scene. They hint at it later when Galloway comes in. But by Optimus just saying, yeah, we're here to hunt the rest of the Decepticons, it plants the idea in your mind that, oh yeah, there's still Decepticons here. And we don't know yet that they're here for something. But like, it's teased that there are quite a few Decepticons still left on Earth. But again, the scene with Galloway at the nest base later really helps establish all that. So I'll wait till we get there. So shit hits the fan very quickly because it's Transformers. Stuff has to go wrong. Demolisher, he's a giant construction vehicle. I don't know the names of my construction vehicles, so I'm not even gonna try. He transforms and he's just wreaking havoc through the city. He's destroying everything. He's killing a bunch of the Nest team. Like it's, it's not, it, it's not going well in any way, shape or form. And then at the same time, there's a second Decepticon, which they pick up on their scanner named Sideways, who has a cool character design, but I guess they just decided is isn't gonna transform. He transforms once, but he's silhouetted and obscured. So you don't really see him, and then he just gets cut in half by Sideswipe. Damn, I'm good. One thing about this scene, however, that will always be funny to me, is how this plan worked. So they have Nest on the ground, they bring in Ironhide, they've got Sideswipe RC, they've got the twins, like they're ready to go and then Demolisher transforms, no one stands a chance, and then they airdrop Optimus in, and he just kills, he just whoops Demolisher's ass instantly. So my question is, if they had the big dude sitting in the C-17, why didn't they just lead with Optimus? Why, like, I would put Optimus on the ground, quite honestly, uh, but then again, I'm not a Black Ops guy, so I don't know but that's just my two cents on the thing. But anyway, weird military tactics aside, spoiler alert, they airdrop Optimus Prime into Shanghai. And if you're gonna introduce Optimus Prime into your movie, having him airdrop in and defeat the biggest Decepticon we've seen on screen, at least for a couple hours, is the way to do it. And they're playing his theme and he's all clean and fresh looking like it seems like they gave him a paint job and he's just ready to whoop ass it's beautiful i love it i love seeing optimus do cool stuff I'm in with that said though this is where we have to talk about the biggest criticism against optimus prime in any of these films he really likes killing people. I have to have this discussion again when we talk about Dark of the Moon because it's even crazier in Dark of the Moon. But in Revenge of the Fallen, uh, yeah, he has some brutal kills, including the way he kills Demolisher where he talks some shit and point blank shoots Demolisher in the face to kill him. And I think there's a few factors at play here that I don't think people pay attention to when they blame Optimus Prime for being a bloodthirsty lunatic in this scene. First, Demolisher has killed a lot of Optimus' allies because several of the Nest people were killed in this. And these are Optimus' friends. Like, they live together, they chill together. Several of them have died, so that's got to be upsetting. And then number two, Demolisher killed a lot of innocent people like not not a few like i mean he was massacring people left and right just knocking them out of the way or i guess more accurately rolling right through them because he can and he's a decepticon he doesn't care but most importantly optimus prime's mission is to kill decepticons so why are people upset when he kills decepticons and it wasn't even a Decepticon who was begging for his life. It was a Decepticon who was actively threatening Earth and everyone on it. Like, what was Optimus going to do? Be like, yeah, you're fine. No, he's going to shoot him. 
I'm gonna say something that has been on my mind since 2009. And this is a very unpopular opinion. I know pretty much no one else shares this opinion with me, but I need to get it off my chest because I've heard a lot of hate about this particular thing for over a decade. I'm sick of it. I love Sam's parents. Wow. You know what? I don't want to go anywhere with you. I don't want to go to France with you. I don't want to go around the corner with you. All I'm right, going fine. back inside. I'll call you from Paris. I am being dead serious. They crack me up. I'm laughing every scene they're in. They are acting the shit out of these roles, and their comedic timing is brilliant. They're so entertaining to watch, and they actually have a more important role in this film than they did in the first one. And yeah, even though that role involves complicating Megatron's plan for pretty much no reason at all, it is nice that they found a way to work Sam's parents into the plot of this film. And it gives us a very cool fight scene in the third act. So I'll be talking about them more later when they actually show up later in the film, but goddamn, the scene when Sam's mom gets high and just goes around the campus being an absolute menace to society is one of my favorite things in this trilogy. But back to the main story. After I'm done laughing over the fact that Sam's mom will just not stop crying, Sam calls Michaela. Uh, we learn that one, her dad's out of prison. Two, she kind of wants to break up with Sam because she's not vibing with doing a long distance thing. And three, there's a sliver of the AllSpark that is still in Sam's jacket. And when he holds it up and looks at it, he goes nuts and he starts seeing those same symbols that his great grandfather saw, Archibald Witwicky. And then he drops it, it burns through the floor and turns the entire kitchen into Decepticons. The fact that the AllSpark is still a central piece of this movie, despite having been destroyed, is very nice, because this is supposed to be a very important piece of Transformer history. This is such a crucial thing for them, so I like the idea that even when it's gone, it's not gone. It has transformed as the Fallen lays out for us later in the movie, and now all of that knowledge that the AllSpark carries is within Sam. So now Sam is the AllSpark in a way. And because we're getting into weird Transformers history and lore and a bunch of weird kind of complicated stuff, I feel like I need to lay out the plot of this movie as best I can. It's not the greatest plot ever. I mean, again, they didn't have a script, so they're, they're, they're doing the best they can with what they have, which is nothing. This plot is not merely as complicated, convoluted, and confusing as people like to say it is. Because I understood the plot of this movie when I was seven. The Fallen brought the Sun Harvester to Earth because he wanted to harvest Energon. He needed the Matrix of Leadership to power the Sun Harvester so that he could destroy the Sun and harvest Energon, hence the name Sun Harvester. However, the Primes, the original seven Primes, the Fallen's brothers, they sacrificed themselves so that he wouldn't be able to get it, and then they entombed the Matrix, and then the Fallen, fast forward several thousand years, is like, I, I think it's time to reinitiate this plan. One problem, there's still a Prime left, only a Prime can kill me, so we need to get rid of the Prime, and then figure out what we're gonna do from there. And so he sends Megatron to go kill Optimus Prime, so that way the Prime is out of the way, and then the Decepticons can come in uh, and make their presence known, then get Sam, harvest Sam's brain that has the information or some of the information that they need to get the Matrix of Leadership, and then they can get that, plug it into the Sun Harvester, and harvest the Sun. And then Sam is like, wait, if the Matrix can power the Sun Harvester, theoretically, that power can bring Optimus back, and then if Optimus is back, we have someone who can kill the Fallen, defeat the Decepticons, and save Earth. Bada bing, bada boom. Not that complicated. Where was I? Oh yeah, Bumblebee's voice sucks again for some reason. This is one of my criticisms of the movie. I'm like, what happened? Because he had a voice at the end of the first one, a perfectly functioning voice. And then this one, he just doesn't have his voice anymore. This scene also sets up the romantic plotline that Sam and Michaela have in this movie, where Sam is just unable 
to admit that he actually loves Michaela. It's a whole thing he's got going on. And, oh my god, it's so cheesy. But I'm gonna keep it real with you guys. I am a sucker for rom-coms. Like, I unapologetically love rom-coms. And this movie is just a rom-com with robots. So, I don't care how cheesy it is. I'm getting something very entertaining that I want to see out of it. For how good Sam and Michaela's romantic plotline is in this movie, which it is, I'm putting my foot down right there, it's good. There is a better love story in this film. And that is between Leo and Seymour Simmons. I kid. They do crack me up though, and I wish Leo was in Dark of the Moon. Okay, let's talk about the Autobot twins now. Skids and Mudflap. And I know this video is supposed to be me mostly praising this movie, but I cannot defend these guys. They are awful. They are the worst characters in the trilogy. They are cringy, they're annoying, they're not funny in the slightest, and they are very racist. The only entertainment I get out of these characters is watching Bumblebee beat the shit out of them every other scene because they're annoying the crap out of them. And you know it's bad when they were so disliked and so offensive and so hated that they're completely taken out of the next movie with zero explanation whatsoever and no one even questions it. Another character that we meet in the exact same scene that were properly introduced to Skids and Mudflap is Galloway. But before we meet Galloway, Optimus Prime gets his big transformation of the movie. Okay, anyway, back to Galloway. I hate him. Like, he, he's not a likable character. He has a reason to be here. I understand why he's in the story. Or at least I do nowadays. When I was little, I just didn't like the character at all because he was mean to Optimus Prime. But in this movie, now that I'm older and I actually have, you know, higher level thinking and I can process basic story concepts, I understand why Galloway's here. He needs to be here. And what Galloway's supposed to be making fun of is funny. It's a character trope that they do multiple times in this trilogy. It's the straight man who is so serious. He takes himself seriously. He thinks everything else needs to operate the same way he does. But at the same time, he is so stupid and doesn't realize it. But no one else can say anything. But he's in direct opposition to both Prime and Lennox. And if you want proof that this movie did not have a script, let me present to you the dumbest scene in this film. It needed to be conveyed to both the Decepticons and the audience that not only is Megatron at the bottom of the ocean in the Laurentian Abyss, but also that the last known piece of the AllSpark, because they don't know about the one Sam has, the last known piece of the AllSpark is in a deep storage vault. And instead of this being revealed naturally through dialogue, Soundwave, who's just floating around in space, I guess, wires himself into a satellite, turns it towards Nest's base, and Galloway lays out in detail, where exactly Megatron is, I'm surprised he didn't say his exact coordinates, where exactly the AllSpark is, again, surprised he didn't just say his exact coordinates, and then just says a bunch of other random information, just out of the blue, because this information needed to be learned. Also in the movie, at one point, the Fallen just straight up says out loud what his weakness is because they couldn't find a natural way to do it. But hey, I guess that's what happens when you don't have a script for your movie. I adore Optimus in this scene. Well, I adore Optimus in this entire movie, but I really love him in this scene because everything Galloway throws towards Optimus, Optimus throws right back. He's not putting up with this guy's nonsense. He does not care. Also. 
they set up Dark of the Moon in this scene. What if we leave and you're wrong? Two scenes I like. Both parts of the plan to get Megatron back because they need his body and they need the AllSpark shard so they can reignite it with Energon. And so, first off, there's no way that Ravage would ever be able to breach the perimeter like he did. That shit would be locked down, but whatever, I don't care. The scene is fun and I love the weird little robot that Ravage creates to actually go get the shard. Think about how crazy this is. So, the Decepticons send Soundwave to get the shard. But Soundwave is like, I'm not going to go to Earth and get it. So he sends Ravage to go to Earth and get the shard. But Ravage is like, well, I want to do it. So Ravage drops metal balls down a pipe that goes into the building that forms into a Decepticon so that that Decepticon can get the shard for Ravage so that the Decepticons can then get Megatron back. And then I love the actual mission to bring Megatron back to life because it is executed with perfection. They go down there, they tear Decepticon apart, use him for parts, put the AllSpark in Megatron, and Megatron jumps right up out of the ocean, cuts a submarine in half, and flies off into space, because he's cool like that. And no, I'm not gonna talk about the fact that five Decepticons go down, they kill a Decepticon, bringing it to four Decepticons, revive Megatron, making it five Decepticons, and then six Decepticons are tagged going up to the surface. I'm not gonna talk about it, because I don't feel like talking about it. And Megatron's design in this movie is next level good. The parts they got from the other Decepticon, I guess, were tank parts. So when they put those on Megatron, who's a Cybertronian jet, when the AllSpark hit him and it kind of rearranged some stuff, he just turned into this really cool looking flying tank. And then Sam goes to college. And Sam being in college, yeah, we're not seeing Autobots kill shit, so like kind of a bummer. But it's pretty important because it has to establish a lot of stuff. Also, it's a transition between the cool stuff and the next batch of cool stuff. So what it has to set up is one, it has to reinforce the fact that Sam is seeing shit and Sam and Michaela are now long distance and kind of having some, some trouble with it. Also, Sam hates his roommates. There is this hot chick who is just there and she's kind of sus and Leo's always talking about her and she seems weirdly obsessed with Sam just suspicious all around, and then also Dwight Schrute is hitting on students in front of the Dean. Really important stuff that we gotta set up here. Really, really, really crucial. Let's talk about Alice, the Decepticon that everyone seems to think is a plot hole, despite the fact that she's not. The movie never explicitly states it. It doesn't really illustrate it particularly well, or at all for that matter, but it's pretty clearly implied that she is just a special form of Decepticon that can disguise herself as a human. Again, I picked up on this when I was seven, and I think that she's a really interesting character. You can pinpoint pretty easily that she's a bad guy, and that she's up to no good, and that she wants something from Sam, but also, like, you kind of can't figure out what exactly is wrong with her. She's just Coco for Cuckoo Puffs. And maybe my sense of humor is just really dumb, but Bumblebee slamming her into the dashboard and then pissing on her cracks me up every single time. <laughs> Optimus Prime was never the main character of this trilogy. That's another thing that I don't like about Age of Extinction is they really overcook it with Optimus Prime. Optimus is not the lead. He is the side character who comes in in a time of need to be a bright light, a source of hope, and a source of optimism. Hell, his name is one letter away from the word optimist. That's literally what he was named after. These movies are about Sam Wiki and Bumblebee. Optimus is the side character. But this film gets to play with that idea in a fun way because they have to kill Optimus Prime soon, meaning that they have to build up a relationship between Optimus and Sam 
they also have to show just how important Optimus is to Sam and how equally important Sam is to Optimus Prime. Because they need to have that established, they have to explain how important he is and really build up his importance in this story so that when Megatron kills him later, you feel the effects of it. Uh, it it's like actually a beautiful fight. Optimus rips Grinder's head in half, he cuts Starscream's arm off, and then hits Starscream with it. He beats up Megatron but forgets to finish the job before Megatron kills him. Like, they are just ripping each other to pieces. It's great. But I digress. So they have to establish Optimus, and they also have to set up Sam's arc for this movie, which they filter through a conversation he has with Optimus, where they basically spell out the exact arc that Sam Witwicky is going to go on in this movie. And I think it works off the first film really well. Sam does not want to deal with what happened in the first film again. He wants to be a normal kid with normal problems and just live his life and grow up and do his thing. He does not need the Autobots anymore. But, you know, shit hits the fan in the movie that doesn't exactly happen. And while Sam's arc is not as fleshed out and given the time it needs to build, like in the first film, the third film, again, no writers, it is there. If you pay attention to it, you'll pick up on it. It works really well going off the first film. It leads into the third film really nicely of him learning that he is this really important guy. He is the chosen one. He has to do this mission. And as much as he would love it, he does not get this normal life. And I just mentioned it, but this movie does a variation of the chosen one plot line. Sam doesn't realize he's the chosen one until like very close to the end of the movie, but it's such a holy shit moment when it happens. And they set it up here. They telegraph where Sam and Optimus are going to go so well. So they set it up here with Optimus's line. Sam, fate rarely calls upon us at a moment of our choosing. And then with this line. You don't need me. We do more than you know. Now remember those two lines. Because they are the whole movie. Back to the fourth battle, because it's the best scene in the movie. Optimus talks an unbelievable amount of shit in this fight, and I love it. He sees Megatron and doesn't even question how he's back. He just starts roasting the shit out of him. And, you know, if, if my former brother, who I had to help kill because he was trying to destroy humanity, and now he's back trying to destroy humanity again and trying to kill one of my best friends in the process, I'd roast him too. But Optimus does get a nice dose of karma because Megatron roasts him as he shoves his sword through Optimus Prime. So, there you go, Optimus. You learned your lesson. So And then Transformers Revenge of the Fallen starts. It's funny to think about a movie not starting until halfway through, but it's true. Because after Optimus dies, this movie takes a complete shift and the rest of this movie and its sequel are a considerable amount darker than everything was before Optimus gets killed. Like, it just completely changes the status quo of the franchise. Another criticism this movie attempts to fix is that it's too human focused. I don't take issue with this and I explained in the first film why it being predominantly human driven made a lot of sense and why it had to work. But in this movie they try to fix that a bit by putting some Transformers on both teams. Lennox and Epps have all the Autobots and then Sam, Michaela, Simmons and Leo have Bumblebee, the Twins and Wheelie who we'll talk about soon. And yeah, I wish Skids and Mudflap weren't here. I wish they got killed, but at least I get to watch Bumblebee beat them up. So there's that. Don't you guys love how they just dump Optimus's body on the tarmac like a sack of dog shit? It's so funny to me. It's like this big emotional moment. The music is swelling. The sun's going down. It's like really somber. It's really beautiful looking. And then this happens. This movie does a lot of interesting things with its characters, and they actually get a lot of time to grow in this film. 
I'm gonna kind of skip over the fallen landing on Earth and revealing Transformers to the world because yes, it's a very cool scene. I love that scene. I could rewind that scene and watch it over and over, but I want to talk more about how the film moves on from that and builds on that scene than actually just lingering on the scene. Sam has to be in a leadership role this time around, which is a natural place to take the character. In the first one, he did not want to do a simple task that Lennox gave him. In this movie, he now has to do that, and he does not have Lennox this time around. He does not have Optimus this time around. He has to lead a team of people who are expected to save the world, but he has no idea what he's supposed to do. Michaela gets more to do this time around because she has a Decepticon that she carries with her, so she's the person who actually has more of the insight this time around. She has the answers to people's questions. And with that, let's talk about Wheelie. I fucking love Wheelie. Besides him humping Megan Fox's leg, I love everything about this character. I love how small he is. I love how not intimidating he is, but how big he thinks he is. I love how dumb yet smart he is at the same time. I love how much shit he talks. I love his little facial expressions. I love the fact that they got SpongeBob SquarePants himself, Tom Kenny, to voice him. I love that the Decepticons are spread so thin that this guy is hunting down an AllSpark charge is this little like two pound robot and I love that he doesn't realize they already got a piece of the shard so he doesn't really have anything to do in this movie. Just he is so amazing and what makes it better is how essential to the story he is on top of that. But then he just leaves the movie and it makes me sad. Low profile, don't make a scene. Okay? Yeah, some of us got work to do. Dumb autobots. And John Turturro as Seymour Simmons returns in this movie, and it's such a treat to see him. I was so happy when I saw this film in theaters for the first time, and he showed up. If you want to talk about some consistent character writing and some consistent character development, this dude has it. He is maybe the best written character in this trilogy. So Sector 7 got shut down, he lost everything, and now he has to work in this deli so that he can make any amount of money that he can, but he has also turned the basement of it into his conspiracy theorist den where he still researches Transformers and tries to hunt Decepticons. It is beautiful. This is the best he gets in the trilogy. Like, what they decided to do with his character is great. And they pair him up with Sam's roommate, Leo. And this is the greatest character pairing in the history of film. Seymour's the guy who's silly, but takes himself almost too seriously. And Leo is just kind of a straight up idiot who is not at all ready for this mission that Simmons is now forcing on him. And so pairing those two up from the moment Simmons is introduced to the end of the movie, they're paired up. It was such a smart thing to do. Oh yeah, another great joke. How many times can you get tased in the nuts before you can't have kids, huh? You know. The other character in this film who I love is Jetfire. Before I actually talk about Jetfire, I just want to point out that Jetfire has the best line in the movie. My father, while he was a wheel, the first wheel, do you know what he transformed into? Nothing! But he did so with honor, dignity, damn it. What does it mean? Couldn't tell you. That's why I love it. Jetfire is an exposition machine. Pun 100% intended. That's why he's in the movie. But the reason he works where Galloway and the Fallen don't is because the characters literally get Jetfire because he's the exposition machine. They need someone who was around during the Fallen's time that can explain everything to them. And that's what they get Jetfire for. So when he starts explaining stuff, it works. And the character's just too much fun to hate. He is so grumpy. On my most recent rewatch of this that I did to make this video, I really tried to pay attention to Jetfire, and his story is beautiful. So he is a really old Transformer. Like, he is from the Fallen's time, and you 
can get a hint that he was insanely powerful back in the day. And Jetfire was on the mission Sam was now on, but he just cannot do it anymore. He's not physically or mentally able to do it anymore. He doesn't know what he's saying. He can't remember what he's saying. His abilities act up, like he just randomly starts shooting missiles and his parachute and he's always falling over and he just doesn't know what he's doing anymore. And it's sad to see a Transformer this old and struggling this much. And he switches from the Decepticons to the Autobots because he hates the hatred that the Decepticons spread and he just really wants peace. And above all, Jetfire clearly just wants to meet a prime. So his reaction when he finally gets to see a living prime is beautiful. Living prime. <laughs> I don't believe it. And then he gets to sacrifice himself so that said prime can defeat the fallen. So not only does Jetfire meet a prime, he is also spiritually fighting alongside that Prime. There is no way that anyone in their right mind could hate Jetfire's story in this movie. It is beautiful and it is perfect. Also, he has some of my favorite lines in the film. When dawn alights the dagger's tip, three kings will reveal the doorway. The other storyline in this film that I really like is Sam being wanted by everyone because the Fallen put a hit out on Sam that is basically along lines of, y'all are going to have a really painful death if you don't bring me Sam. And so everyone's looking for him. The Decepticons are looking for him. The FBI is looking for him. They have to hide from the friggin' Egyptian government. And then they have to be able to call Lennox to bring Optimus to Egypt, but they can't reveal Optimus's name or that they have Sam. Like, it's so cool. Egypt is basically perfection as far as I'm concerned. Just from a character standpoint to an action standpoint, from an emotional standpoint, once they get to Egypt and Jetfire sends them on their way. I don't really have any movie breaking criticisms besides the cop out way in which Jetfire dies, the twins, and the fact that the Autobots keep yelling at Sam to get to Optimus instead of just transforming and driving him to Optimus. And the pair of scenes where Sam loses and earns the matrix of leadership are, and I'm not kidding, Outside of the Force fight and Optimus' resurrection, the two best parts of this film, by a lot, they are such beautifully well done scenes. So Skids and Mudflap just had to fight, and in doing so, one of them, can't remember which one, don't care to remember, gets thrown into the wall and there's like air coming out of it. So after Bumblebee beats them up, he shoots the wall and then it's revealed that, that is the Tomb of the Primes, they're inside the tomb. And side note, I love that the tomb is not extravagant. It is just a pile of dead robots holding the matrix of leadership. But at the same time, it still is a spectacle to behold. And the matrix turns to dust the moment Sam picks it up, which is a plant for a great payoff later. But in this scene, he says a line. And I don't know why this line gives me chills, but I'll be goddamned. I love this entire exchange between Sam and Michaela so much. Everyone's after me because of what I know. And what I know is that this is gonna work. How do you know it's gonna work? Because I believe it. Remember when I said to remember those two lines that Optimus said? This is why. Notice how everything is happening to Sam at the worst most inconvenient time for him. And the line, We do more than you know. We are here. We are at that point. The Autobots need Sam more than anything. Sam is the key to saving the world right now. He is the most important thing on planet Earth. But it's also a double meaning because the Decepticons need Sam because they need the Matrix so they can destroy the sun. The final battle of this movie is pretty dope. In the first movie, they were trying to get Sam out. Now they have to get Sam in. 
And because it's fun, let's do a final battle breakdown and just look at everything that's going on here. So the Autobots, the Nest Team, and the Body of Optimus Prime airdrop into Egypt, but not before they drop Galloway out of the plane in one of the funniest scenes in the whole movie. Megatron and Starscream, who are like hella smart, realize, hold up, if they brought Optimus's body, and we know Sam has the key to the Matrix of Leadership, they're probably gonna try to put two and two together and bring Optimus to life, and that can't happen. So Megatron just initiates an assault, and all those Decepticons that landed with the Fallen, who were on standby this entire time, come on in, and uh, they start throwing down with the Autobots. Meanwhile, everyone is looking for Sam Witwicky and trying to prevent him from getting to Optimus Prime, so Simmons and Leo decide they'll split off from Sam and Michaela and try to lead some of the fire away while Sam gets to Optimus, and that leads them straight into a trap known as Devastator, who is just a bunch of Transformers all put together they has to climb the pyramid and reveal the machine so that way when they get the matrix they can plug it in and when I was little what I, I got for Christmas of the, the Christmas this movie came out I got the giant devastator figure that came with all the individual Decepticons and you could put them together and to this day I'm pissed I got rid of it I always prefer Decepticons that are named and look distinct and feel like they could whoop the Autobots asses. That's not the case in this. 95% of the Decepticons in this fight are unnamed, generic looking drones. They don't transform into anything. They all look the same. Um, but hey, at least it was set up. We know the armies here. We know they're on standby waiting for Megatron's order. Same with the Fallen. I actually never picked up on the fact that the Fallen does not join the fight until he has a lock on where the Matrix of Leadership is. And in the middle of the battle, we get our little side chapters of what the characters are doing separate from the main war going on. And in this one, the big side chapter they give us is a part of the Decepticons plan that kind of doesn't really make sense and there was no reason for them to do it, uh, but they do. That they, they use Sam's parents as leverage. So when they're all landing around the world, Rampage lands in France and he just takes Sam's parents. I'm guessing, I don't know how he learned that those were Sam's parents, but he did take them to Egypt and he just uses them as leverage so that Sam will let his guard down and be vulnerable instead of just killing Sam like Megatron does. But I'll take it because I get to see Bumblebee whoop a lot of ass. Him bodying Rampage is cool, but him ripping out Ravage's spine and hitting Rampage with it is even cooler. And in terms of scenes I used to not like when I was little that I have a massive respect and appreciation for now, Sam saying goodbye to his parents and sending them away with Bumblebee is highly emotional and, dare I say, a perfect scene. First off, the performances all those actors give are great and they have amazing chemistry with each other. Also, it's Sam fully embracing his destiny. You wouldn't really notice that it's wrapping up his arc, but his arc wraps up right here. It's him fully embracing his destiny, fully embracing his mission. It's also him kind of telling Michaela he loves her and her saying she loves him without either of them explicitly saying it because she refuses to leave Sam. She refuses to go with Bumblebee and Sam's parents and they go to do this mission together, which is them saying I love you without saying I love you. So it wraps up that. And also, it's where Sam grows up. He is no longer a kid after this scene. It is, he, he goes from that boy into a full-on man and a hero and a soldier and all that. And he also, basically, by sending Bumblebee away, it's him realizing he doesn't need Bumblebee anymore. I'm telling you, this movie's a lot deeper than people get it credit for. And let's talk about Sam's death, because this is the biggest misconception of the trilogy. 
is what exactly the hell is happening here when Sam dies. So Megatron shoots, splash damage from Megatron hits Sam, Sam dies. I mean, I was gonna say, I wrote in my script that he basically dies, but considering he was flatlined, yeah, he died. And so Lennox tries to bring him back and it's like the music and the cinematography and everything in the scene is great of them trying to bring him back and just all the sadness. Bumblebee dropping to his knees gets me. Anyway, Sam dies. He wakes up in this weird plane of existence where he meets the original Seven Primes who gave their lives to prevent the Fallen from getting the Matrix of Leadership. Return now to Optimus. Merge the Matrix with his spark. It is and always has been your destiny. Yeah, it might just be the best scene in the movie, actually, now that I think about it. So let's talk about this. For years, nonstop since this movie cut came out, the discourse around it, part of the discourse around it, has been, oh, well, it's really stupid that Sam Wiki goes to Transformer Heaven instead of Human Heaven. He didn't go to Transformer Heaven. The Primes whose spirits are basically within the matrix of leadership, they pulled Sam into their little matrix soul world so they could commune with him because that's an ability you get when you have the matrix of leadership. And so he's just communing with the primes. Then they inform Sam that he's the chosen one and he's been on a chosen one arc for two movies now. It ties everything together and outside of Jetfire's wheel comment, it is the best line in the movie and it's not even close. I'm sorry, Optimus, you say some cool shit, but you don't really touch this. And I love the implication here that everything Sam has ever done in his life has been building up to him earning the Matrix and reviving the last Prime. Like, how do people not think this is cool? And the idea of the Matrix not being found, but earned, there's no really other way to say it other than fucking perfect. The way that Sam comes back is pretty awesome too, because the Primes basically have to sacrifice themselves again so that Sam can come back to life and revive Optimus. And that's really the core of this movie. They've been mentioning it in lines, they've been alluding to it, one of the themes of this movie at its core is this story about sacrifice and things that you have to lose. And there are so many friggin' sacrifices made in this. I mean, for starters, none of these characters are ever the same after this. They, they sacrifice everything they know and love for this mission. But then just also look at this from the standpoint of how much death there is in the movie for the sake of selflessness and the betterment of everything else. Sam has to die and sacrifice himself so that he can get the Matrix and bring Optimus back. And then you have the Prime sacrificing themselves yet again. They do it twice in this movie. They do it once so that the Fallen can't get the Matrix and then they do it again to bring Sam back. That yellow glow when Sam comes back to life is the same glow that happened when the Primes gave their lives to create the Tomb of the Primes. They are permanently gone. They destroyed their physical bodies. Here they destroy their spiritual selves to restore Sam's soul to him. So there are no Primes now to talk to. There is no realm within the Matrix of Leadership to go to anymore. Optimus truly is the last prime. That's that sacrifice. I'd say that's the biggest sacrifice. And then of course Optimus. He dies. That's like the biggest sacrifice you can make. And then Jetfire does his sacrifice so that Optimus can be his full self and go whoop the fallen's ass. That's what he says with this line. Fulfill your destiny. That is the whole thing in this movie. Sacrifice and destiny. Let's play Optimus's line again from earlier in the movie. Sam, fate rarely calls upon us at a moment of our choosing. Now, let's talk about Optimus Prime. So Sam comes back, he says he loves Michaela, beautiful little heartfelt romantic moment. And then everyone gathers around Optimus 
to see him come back to life. The Autobots, the humans, there's no more gunfire. Megatron, Starscream, they're watching, they're not doing anything. Even the Fallen is watching this because why would you not want to see the moment that the last Prime comes back to life? That's awesome. And cue the scene that made me cheer harder than I have ever cheered over a movie in my entire life. And while we're at it, let's also just play Jeff Fire's line again when he sees a prime, because it makes me feel good. Living prime. <laughs> oh, I don't believe it. Let's talk about the final fight between Optimus, Megatron, and the Fallen, because a lot of people hate it, and I understand why. It's over in like a minute and a half. It's really not that exciting for a threat who has been, you know, built up throughout the movie as like the big shit Transformer. There were seven of these guys who couldn't beat him and then Optimus just takes him out in no time at all. And yeah, I get it. I really do. I would have loved to see a longer fight. I think we need a longer fight. We needed cooler stuff in the fight. We need an Optimus to take some friggin' damage. Like, it needed to keep going. But I've come to terms with why it's short. I can understand why it's short. Not just from a production standpoint, but from like an in-universe reason. The Fallen has kind of been shown to not be that great of a fighter. If he was a great fighter, he would have done this mission himself. So yeah, also, Megatron's a lot weaker from when he came back. He's not nearly as strong as he was in the first movie. And then you have Optimus Prime, who is basically God. Not only is he running on Matrix power, but he also has all of Jetfire's parts on him. We get a hint of how strong Jetfire may have been in his day, because the shit Optimus is pulling off, Jetfire was able to pull off at some point. I would love to see it. Optimus fighting the Fallen is the more anticlimactic of the two fights that happen here. He hits him a few times, gives us this iconic line, Give me your faith. and then punches the Fallen Spark out of his chest. And yeah, once again, people are like, man, Optimus is hella violent, but you know, I chalk it up to a couple things. First, the Fallen was like three seconds away from destroying the sun. Uh, two, Optimus is so jacked up on rage and adrenaline at this point, he's just gonna start killing people in some crazy ass ways. Like, how can you not at this point? I, I love the way he does it. It's so satisfying to see the Fallen just get tossed around like a baby doll. The fight with Megatron is the more exciting thing because, I mean, Optimus is just doing the coolest stuff he has ever done. He is letting Megatron have it. He's showing Megatron just how pissed off he is that Megatron killed him earlier in the movie. So he does the insanely badass thing of breaking Megatron's arm so that he shoots himself in the face. Then he chops the arm off. Then he blasts him with the Blackbird's jet thrusters through a wall. His mistake? was letting him live. It's so exciting, and I will never forget the reaction in the theater when Megatron blew his own face off. And then Starscream has a great line that's just, it's such a nice jab at Megatron. Not to call you a coward, Master, but sometimes cowards do and that's basically Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. You know, all the humans reunite, we get a happy little ending, Sam and Michaela confess how much they love each other, and then Optimus Prime gives a speech on an aircraft carrier while looking to the stars while Linkin Park plays. No, it's not great. It is the worst of the three. It's kind of a mess. It, it's got several issues, a couple plot holes, like things that just don't make sense, and it's definitely the worst of the trilogy, but to answer the question I posed in the title of this video, is Transformers Revenge of the Fallen underrated? I'm gonna say it is a bit underrated. I think there are a lot of elements to this movie that even though, as I said, there's a lot of things in it that are just weird and it's kind of a mess, it comes together in a really satisfying way. And when I think of some of my favorite scenes from these movies, I feel like Revenge of the Fallen has a lot of them. The, the forest battle, 
uh, Sam and Optimus's respective deaths and resurrections, all of Jetfire's storyline. And the music is a step up this time around, which is an insane compliment because the music was already out of the park good in the first one, but Steve Jablonski went even harder with this one. The film has a lot more good than bad. It has a lot of good that I don't think people really pay attention to. I challenge anyone, and I this is what I just did on my rewatch. I know it can be done. I challenge a Revenge of the Fallen hater to rewatch this movie without any of the internet influence. Don't even think about it. Don't even take your phone into the room with you. Just rewatch this movie like it's your first time watching it. Take it in. Pay attention to the stories, the themes, everything that is happening in this movie. And I think you will find a lot more beauty in it than you might think is there. So again, it's not great, but I'm done saying it's bad. Whew, okay, there we go. That is my video on Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. It's been in the works for a while. Editing this is not going to be fun, but I felt like talking about it. Glad I finally talked about it. Next month... I will be back with the final installment of this trilogy, Transformers Dark of the Moon. I have mentioned several times before, I mentioned in the other video, I'm not doing Age of Extinction and The Last Knight. Those movies do not fit with what Michael Bay originally wanted to do with these characters. I don't like them. And they feel so separate, I view them as separate. For me, this story ends with Dark of the Moon and was rebooted with Bumblebee. So stay tuned because exactly one month after this goes up, you should see the video concluding this series of videos. So there you guys go. Please let me know your thoughts on Transformers Revenge of the Fallen and this video down in the comments below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. See if I pointed out anything you may have missed or if you guys noticed something that I may not have necessarily pointed out in this video. Let's have a fun little discussion down in the comments and leave a like on this video as well. That would mean a lot. Uh, let, let's, let's see if we can beat the previous video in terms of likes, comments, and views. That'd be dope because the first one had a lot more than I thought it was gonna get. So we're doing really good. I want to see if we can top it. So let's try to make it happen, folks. And then also subscribe and hit that bell so that when my next video drops, and don't worry, it'll be a banger, you guys will be notified immediately. So that's going to be it. I will see you all in the next one. Give me your